Peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, The first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, Love your neighbour as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these, Amen. Lord, have mercy. God is love, and we are God's children. There is no room for fear in love. We love because God loved us first. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith. God our Father, we confess to you and to our fellow members in the body of Christ that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and in what we have failed to do. We are truly sorry. Forgive us our sins, and deliver us from the power of evil. For the sake of your Son, who died for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. God, who is both power and love, forgive you and free you from your sins. Heal and strengthen you by his Spirit, and raise you to new life 
in Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, by whose grace alone we are accepted and called to your service, strengthen us by your Holy Spirit and make us worthy of our calling. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading in the book of the prophet Isaiah. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits upon the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. Who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to live in? Who brings princes to naught and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing? Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth. When he blows upon them and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble, to whom then will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host and numbers them, calling them all by name, because he is great in strength, mighty in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strength to the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings of eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. This is the word of the Lord. A reading in the first letter of St Paul to the Corinthians. If I proclaim the gospel, this gives me no ground for boasting. For an obligation is laid on me, and woe to me if I do not proclaim the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am entrusted with a commission. What then is my reward? Just this, that in my proclamation I may make the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my rights in the gospel. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that I might by all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, 
so that I may share in its blessings. The word of the Lord. O oh, bless the Lord my soul, let all within me joy, and make my tongue to bless his name, whose mercies are divine. O oh, bless the Lord my soul, nor let his mercy According to St. Mark, in the first chapter, beginning at the 29th verse. Glory to Christ our Saviour. As soon as Jesus and his disciples left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. And then the fever left her and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons and the whole city was gathered around the door and he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. And when they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighbouring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also. For that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. Give thanks to the Lord for his glorious gospel. Praise to Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It was a Tuesday afternoon in the old Edinburgh Royal Infirmary near the Meadows and I was visiting one or two patients and, as the phrase went, doing sick communions. One of the patients was the retired Bishop of Edinburgh, Alistair Haggart, who it turned out was in the last days of his life. He had suffered a stroke Though at that point, while confined to bed, he was still alert and could hold as bright and intelligent a conversation as he ever could. Having finished our short communion service, the man in the next bed leaned over and said, It's okay for you guys, you get insurance from above. And as quick as anything, Alistair replied, no, we don't get insurance from above. 
we get assurance from above. Not insurance, assurance. In monetary terms, we understand the difference. With insurance, you're required to make regular payments and will only receive something back if you have a valid claim. With assurance, you make regular payments and are certain of receiving something back given some predefined situation. In faith terms, some may try to convince you that it's like insurance. As long as you make the regular payments, go to church every Sunday, say your prayers regularly, be kind to your neighbour. As long as you do these things, God will give you a reward when things go wrong. The ultimate reward is eternal life after you die. And if we default on any of our payments, we will lose any payout. And in faith terms, assurance is very different. A promise is held out and we are free to accept it or reject it. In this case, the promise is a gift. But it's not only a gift that offers something in the future that will change our situation. It offers us something from the very beginning that changes our situation now. It changes how we view ourselves, how we view the world and how we view our place in it. And we behave differently not because we're anticipating some future benefit for ourselves, but because we understand that we are already held within that gift. The prophet Isaiah asks the question, have you not known, have you not heard, have you not understood? He reminds his readers of what God has done first in creation and then through history and then reminds them of God, what God is doing and will do. Isaiah reminds us that God involves himself in our story because we are part of God's story. Yes, there have been times when from the human perspective Jacob or Israel has felt disregarded, neglected by God, when it seemed God had been absent from their story. They were so caught up in the immediacy of their personal moment of need or trouble that they had been unable to look beyond that to the possibility of something better. But Isaiah says, look at the things of creation. Look at the skies, how unchanging they are, how predictable. And in the realms of time and space, their constancy is a sign of God's constancy. And so for Israel, their own history, their time of the past, their time of the present, the time of their future will be a sign of God's constancy. And that should give them a sense of assurance, assured of God's constancy, not just in the past that they might remember, but in the present and in the future. And are these wonderful lines. God does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youth will faint and grow weary and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord will renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. However 
faint, weary and exhausted it may seem at the moment, there will be the chance to run and not faint. And in today's reading from Mark's Gospel, we begin to hear about Jesus' healing ministry. We're still in chapter one as we will read this gospel through the Sundays of this year. Jesus has called the fishermen to follow him. And he has gone to the synagogue with them to offer some teaching about his message of the kingdom. And he has cast out a demon from a man possessed. And the worshippers in the synagogue are amazed at his authority both in the teaching he offers and in his power to heal. And we pick up that story as Jesus, with the fishermen, arrive back at Simon's house. And he heals Simon Peter's mother-in-law of her fever. And she begins to serve them. He's taken away the thing that stops her doing what she wants to do. And by this time, the whole neighbourhood has heard of what Jesus was doing. And everyone had gathered round the door. And in response, he offers healing and casts out demons for those who are ill. And as I thought about this episode in conjunction with the Isaiah reading, it seemed to me that Jesus understands the people. He is seeing life and the world from their eyes. They are unable to hear his message of the kingdom because they are so taken up with their own illnesses and hardships. They're caught up in their own immediate story the story they tell themselves about themselves. Jesus wants them to hear a different story. And as we read through the Gospels, we often get a sense of Jesus being apparently unwilling to offer healing. And when he does, he orders those who are healed to not to publicise the fact that he'd done it. The story of their healing is not what is important. What is important is that they can now look beyond their illness to a different story. They can hear Jesus' message. For Jesus, the most important, the most urgent part of his ministry was not about healing, but it was about preaching the message of the kingdom. And if that meant healing people so they could hear the message, then he would do that. Because what's the point of preaching the message if people were unable to hear? First, he had to de redirect their thoughts away from themselves and the current situation to the possibility of a different future. Jesus understands their situation. He put himself in their position so that he would understand what it would take to make it possible for them to hear his message. And so there are the times when it was important to take away their suffering so that they could turn their thoughts away from themselves, from their own story, to the story of God's assurance. And then we're told in the morning, Jesus seeks out a place of quiet in order to offer prayer. To have a prayerful conversation with the God who he calls Father. Perhaps he's thinking about his mission and his ministry. And when his disciples come to him, he says that they must leave that place. They must go on to the other towns and cities to preach the message. The people 
there they're leaving behind are probably still asking questions about this Jesus who was someone with authority, who could perform these miracles, who proclaimed this message. Would they now be able to turn their minds to that message? Jesus responds to Simon and Andrew and James and John that they must go to the neighbouring towns. They must proclaim the message because that was what was most important. That was what was most urgent. And we're told that he went throughout Galilee proclaiming the message in the synagogues and casting out demons, helping people to rid themselves of the things that prevented them hearing the message that Jesus was so desperate they should hear. And when we come to Paul, we understand he too has a sense of urgency that people should hear the message of the gospel. And he, Paul, would do whatever it took to open the ears of his listeners, whoever they were. Paul himself had heard and accepted the message of the gospel and understood how urgent it was that as many people as possible should be given that opportunity, not for his own benefit, not for any personal reward, but for the benefit of those whose ears he might open. Paul puts himself, as it were, in their shoes. He doesn't argue from some contradictory standpoint, arguing as some adversary, telling them that they are wrong and he is right. Like Jesus, he puts himself where they are and he directs their focus from there. Perhaps, like Isaiah, he helps them see beyond the inconsistencies and troubles of their own lives to see the points of constancy in the world, in creation, in God's story. And from there, point them to the possibility of that assurance of a future that is constant to be lived out by living the life of the gospel message. And I think it's an important question for our own time. How do we open people's ears to the message of the gospel? Open their ears to the message of God's assurance of a new kingdom. So many things can absorb our attention, focusing on the immediacy of our own troubles and needs that we lose our ability to put things right, that we cannot see beyond to a different possibility, a different source of assurance. So many things can take possession of our lives as we seek pleasure and escape in the physical and in the material that we're unable to see that they don't offer any constancy. In our blindness to that lack of constancy, we're willing to make the insurance payments that physical things can be put back in place if they get destroyed for whatever reason and things will be the same as they were. Jesus and Paul and Isaiah help people to change their focus away from their immediate story of their own present situation, however troubled, out of the little bit of history that seems troubled, to a greater, more constant story which they could be a part of. Actually, a story of which they were already a part, if only they would recognise it. A story which would move them to live differently, not in payment for some future benefit, but because it was the way of living God's story for them. The story of God's constant assurance. As we read the Gospel, the story stays focused on Jesus. 
We don't hear the subsequent stories of those who were healed or fed, of those who were his audience and heard the message of a new kingdom. We don't know what happened to them if their lives were changed in the towns and cities of Galilee. But we're encouraged to think that Jesus' message did change them. We're encouraged to think that Isaiah's prophecy changed people, that Paul's preaching to the early church changed people, that there is a story of God's constancy and God's assurance that can change people. On that Tuesday afternoon, as Bishop Alistair and I shared communion, shared the story of God's assurance, might the man in the next bed have changed his focus from insurance to assurance? Amen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one substance with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate of the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray. We offer our prayers to the Lord, who is the everlasting God, whose understanding is unsearchable, but who has put it into our minds ever to search for his truth and share in the blessings of the gospel. Heavenly Father, we pray for your church, for all who trust in the assurance and the authority of Christ's message of your kingdom. And we pray that in its preaching of your gospel message, the church may do so in a spirit of understanding and in ways that allow people to hear. We pray for the life and witness of this congregation that we may show to the world our confidence in your promises. For Bishop Mark and the clergy and people of this diocese, we pray at this time when churches are closed, that your people will remain constant in faith and in prayer, in their life of faith, that they may know the constancy of Christ's presence with them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creator God, through the words of your prophet, you called your people to see your hand in all that works for good in the world. We think on the places where human selfishness and self-reliance have marred the work of your hands. We pray for peace between nations and between neighbours. We remember in prayer the people of Myanmar, the peoples of Russia, and all places where there is unrest and conflict. We pray for those who work for justice and for freedom. We pray for a right use and a just sharing of our world's resources, for a spirit of generosity from the rich nations towards the poor, 
and pray that the nations of the world will come to an agreement on the right ways to protect the environment. We pray for those in government nationally and locally in our own country, for your spirit of wisdom to guide them in all their decision making. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of mercy, who gives power to the faint and strength to the powerless, as Jesus lifted the burden of illness and disease from those who came to him for healing, let your healing grace bring to effect the efforts of those who work in our health service and all the caring professions. We hold in prayer those who suffer from the effects of the coronavirus, those suffering from other illnesses and chronic conditions of pain, those for whom there is no cure. And we remember those who have asked our prayers that they may find comfort in the assurance of your healing grace. Annie O'Neill, John Campbell, Paula Devlin, Ian Hallam, John McLean, Julia Sinclair, Father Gerald, Sheila Robertson, Stuart Rossthorn. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, you are the everlasting God, and you call us to share in your eternity. We commend to you the souls of those who have died, whose memories we cherish, and who went to their rest in the assurance of your peace. We remember in faith those of this congregation whose year's mind is at this time. Marjorie Lumsden, Alexander Murray, Sarah Wilkinson, Claude Grant, Ian Manson, Herbert Burgess, Donald McLean, Jock McNaughton. Rest eternal grant unto them, O Lord, and let light perpetual shine upon them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And in a moment of quiet, we offer our own prayers. Heavenly Father, accept these and all our prayers, which we offer in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord. Amen. We meet in Christ's name. Let us share his peace. Lord, we come to ask your healing. Teach us of love. All unspoken shame revealing. Teach us of love. Take our selfish thoughts and actions. Petty feuds, divisive actions, hear us now to you appealing, teach us of love. Soothe away our pain and sorrow, hold us in love. Grace we cannot buy or Find us in love, 
stranger neighbor, father, mother, find us in love. Or an eagle at your table, through your spirit make us able to embrace a sister brother, find us in love. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed, Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to offer. Fruit of the vine and work of human hands, it will become the cup of our salvation. Blessed, Blessed be God forever. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. Worship and praise belong to you, Father, in every place and at all times. All power is yours. You created the heavens and established the earth. You sustain in being all that is. In Christ your Son, our life and yours are brought together in a wonderful exchange. He made his home among us that we might forever dwell in you. Through your Holy Spirit, you call us to new birth in a creation restored by love. As children of your redeeming purpose, we offer you our praise with angels and archangels and the whole company of heaven, singing the hymn of your unending glory. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Glory and thanksgiving be to you, most loving Father, for the gift of your Son born in human flesh. He is the Word existing beyond time, both source and final purpose, bringing to wholeness all that is made. Obedient to your will, he died upon the cross. By your power you raised him from the dead. He broke the bonds of evil and set your people free to be his body in the world. On the night when he was given up to death, knowing that his hour had come, having loved his own, he loved them to the end. At supper with his disciples, he took bread and offered you thanks. He broke the bread and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, it is broken for you. After supper he took the cup. He offered you thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, this is my blood of the new covenant. It is poured out for you and for all that sins may be forgiven. Do this in remembrance of me. We now obey your Son's command. We recall his blessed passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and we look for the coming of his kingdom. Made one with him, we offer you these gifts, and with them ourselves, a single, holy, living sacrifice. Hear us, most merciful Father, and send your Holy Spirit upon us, and upon this bread and this wine, that overshadowed by his life-giving power, they may be the body and blood of your Son, and we may be kindled with the fire of your love, and renewed for the service of your kingdom. Help us, who are baptized into the fellowship of Christ's body, to live and work to your praise and glory. May we grow together in unity and love, 
until at last in your new creation we enter into our heritage in the company of the Virgin Mary, the apostles and prophets, and of all our brothers and sisters living and departed. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be to you, Lord of all ages, world without end. Amen. Amen. The living bread is broken for the life of the world. Lord, unite us in this sign. As our Saviour Christ has commanded and taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us peace. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Happy are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and I shall be healed. While we cannot receive the sacrament physically, we do pray that we receive Christ to ourselves where we are. Come, Lord Jesus, in the fullness of your grace, and dwell in the hearts of us, your servants, that adoring you by faith, we may receive you and may with love and thankfulness abide in you, our guide, our bread of pilgrims, our companion on the way. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is gracious, and his mercy endures forever. Let us pray. God of truth, we have seen with our eyes and touched with our hands the bread of life. Strengthen our faith that we may grow in love for you and for each other. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of God that passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Lead us, Heavenly Father, lead us for the worst and past sea. Guard us, guide us, keep us, feed us, for we have no help but Thee. Yet possessing every blessing, give our God our Savior.
Oh. Uh-huh. 